Hello, today we're continuing in our GCSE Physics Revision series, starting a new topic on heat and energy. There are three states of matter. They are solid, liquid and gas. For example, if you take water, in its solid form it's called ice, in its liquid form it's called water, and in its gaseous form we might call it steam. Strictly there is a fourth state of matter, which is called plasma. That is when the temperature is so high that the electrons in the atoms can be driven off of the atoms, leaving just positively charged atoms. So you've got a combination of positively charged atoms, negatively charged electrons, it's all charged particles, and that is called a plasma. That's what you find in something like the sun but you have to get very hot before you get to the state of plasma. So what distinguishes solids from liquids from gases? Well, in a solid, the molecules are all in an ordered array and they are held together by very strong forces. So in between each of the molecules, there's a force it's the intermolecular forces that hold those molecules together. Because it's a solid, it will be at low temperature. Remember, ice is the lowest temperature of the three states. So it has less energy than would be the case if it were either in the liquid or the gas state. Consequently, because it has less energy, the molecules, the individual molecules, have less energy. What they tend to do is to vibrate. But they can't vibrate very much because they are held within these strong forces, these strong forces which are holding them together. So the three key characteristics of a solid are strong forces hold the molecules together, there is not much energy because they are at the coldest end, of the three states of matter, and there is limited vibration of each molecule about fixed positions because the molecules are fixed in this lattice. By contrast, liquids, the molecules are much more likely to be able to move about. There's less of a structure, but there will still be some degree of forces between all the molecules. However, those forces are much weaker and that allows the molecules to move past other molecules. The temperature is higher than it is for solids, but lower than it is for gases. And that means these molecules have more energy than in the case of the solids. So they can vibrate a bit more because they are higher energy. And that means that there will be random movement of these molecules and random speeds. So the three key characteristics of the liquid are that there are weaker forces than there are in solids. There's more energy because it's a higher temperature and therefore you get a more irregular arrangement and the molecules are able to vibrate much more. And there is random speed of the molecules as they are able to move past one another. By the time you get to a gas, the molecules of the gas are pretty much independent. There is hardly any intermolecular forces. That's why the gas can do, can do pretty much what it wants. It's at the highest temperature of the three states of matter and it has therefore more energy. So these molecules individually have energy to travel in any direction they like. So they're free to move at varying speeds, some of them at high speed. So here are the three characteristics of the gas. There are virtually no forces holding the molecules together. There is much more energy because they're at a comparatively higher temperature than their solid or liquid forms and the molecules are individually free to move randomly at any speed, including high speeds. So the hotter something is, the more energy it has and the more movement it will have in its molecules. Hotness is measured by temperature. 
But since I told you that hotness is also a measure of energy, we strictly didn't need the temperature scale. We could just have measured hotness by the energy scale. But in fact, long before it was realised that heat was essentially energy, we have given uh, temperature scales, and I'll talk more about those in just a moment. Why is uh, hotness and energy associated with the speed of molecules? Well, because hotness, we've said, or heat, is associated with energy, and the key energy we're looking at here is kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is a half mv squared, where m is the mass and v is the velocity. So the more hotness, or the more heat, the more energy, the higher the velocity. And of course it works the other way round. If you take heat out of a system, that is if you cool it down, you take energy out of the system. And if you take energy, kinetic energy, out of the system, then the overall velocity of the molecules is going to slow down. We spoke about temperature, and we have temperature scales. Now in my youth, and indeed in some parts of the world, we used the Fahrenheit scale. This was a scale which set the freezing point of water at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, and the boiling point of water at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Those were just settings. There were, incidentally, temperature scales even before that, but we've largely discarded them now. But that's the Fahrenheit scale. Then there's another scale we use, which is called the centigrade scale, or sometimes the Celsius scale. And this sets the, the freezing point of water um, at 0 degrees centigrade, or 0 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of water at 100 degrees centigrade, or 100 degrees Celsius. And the reason it's called centigrade, of course, is because there are 100 degrees between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. To convert from centigrade to Fahrenheit, you multiply by 9 over 5, and then you add 32. So, for example, if you've got 100 degrees centigrade, you multiply that by 9 over 5, that will give you 180, and you add 32, that will give you 212. If you've got naught, you multiply by 9 over 5, which is still naught, you add 32, that gives you 32. The other way round, if you're going from Fahrenheit to centigrade, then you first subtract 32, and then you multiply by 5 over 9. So in the case of the boiling point of water, 212, if you want that in centigrade, first you subtract 32, which gives you 180, then you multiply by 5 over 9, which gives you 100. There is a third scale which is used, which is called the Kelvin scale. Now, one division of the Kelvin scale is equal to one division of the centigrade or Celsius scale. A hundred steps on the Celsius scale is equivalent to a hundred steps on the Kelvin scale. The difference is where you set the zero. And in fact, zero degrees centigrade is equal to more or less 273 Kelvin. Now you'll notice that we said degrees centigrade, but we do not say degrees Kelvin. We just say Kelvin. So 0 degrees centigrade is the same temperature as 273 Kelvin. And 0 Kelvin is minus 273 degrees centigrade. Now, why have we picked the Kelvin scale? And in particular, what is the significance of 0 Kelvin? Well, so far we've been talking about heat being energy, and energy manifested in the molecules by movement. That is to say, you've got a molecule and it may be moving, or it may be vibrating, it may be actually travelling from one place to another, or it may be just vibrating about a fixed position. The fact is, it's moving, and that movement says it has energy, and that energy says it has heat. 
and it therefore has temperature. Now, suppose we cool it down. By cooling it down, we take heat away. That means we reduce the energy. That means we reduce the movement because the kinetic energy will reduce. So we keep taking heat out of the system and the molecule now moves less and less and less and less until it stops. When there is absolutely no movement in the molecule at all, we would say that there's no energy in the molecule at all because it's not moving. There's certainly no kinetic energy there. And if there's no energy, there's no heat. And that means there's no temperature. And what zero Kelvin tells us is that that is the point at which all the energy has been taken out of the system and all the molecules are totally stationary. In fact, you can never get to zero Kelvin, but you can get jolly close. But if you did get to zero Kelvin, that would be the point at which there would be no more energy in the system. And therefore you can never go below zero Kelvin because you can't take more energy out when you're down to zero energy at this point anyway. Which is why zero Kelvin is often called absolute zero. And we'll find out more about that when we look at gases a little later on in the series. Now I want to consider heat transfer. How does heat get moved from one place to another? There are three main ways. There is conduction, which is mainly along solids. Convection, which is mainly through liquids and gases. And radiation, which is actually through all three. Let's first consider conduction, which as I said is mainly in solids. So here is a solid rod. And it is, of course, made up, as I said, of molecules, all of which are in a fairly clear array, and they are all held together by strong forces. And that will be the case right the way through the rod up to this end. I'm just not drawing them all in. But essentially, well-ordered molecules held together by strong forces, not much movement, but a little vibrational energy. Now suppose we heat this end of the rod. What is going to happen? We are going to give more heat to this end of the rod, which means we give more energy to this end of the rod, which is more kinetic energy for the molecules. So the molecules which are vibrating a little will now vibrate a bit more. They're not going to vibrate enough to be able to break free and become a liquid. We're not raising the temperature that much but they are going to be vibrating a little more than they currently are. And as they vibrate a little more vigorously than they were before, they are going to cause the molecule next door to vibrate a little more because they're being held by strong forces. So, you know, it's a bit like you linking arms with somebody else. If you start moving about vigorously, you're going to force them to move about as well. So these molecules are now moving a little more vigorously that causes these to move, which causes these to move, which causes these to move, which causes these to move. And you see what's happening. The, the vigor of the movement of the molecules is moving slowly down the rod. And what is happening is, of course, since that means that the molecules further down the rod are getting more kinetic energy, more energy, that means they're getting more heat. So the heat is passing down the rod. The temperature of the rod is increasing. Up here, you might start with a difference. You know, this might be a rod at 20 degrees Celsius. That's room temperature. You might heat this to say 40 degrees at this end. So you'd have 40 degrees at this end, but still 20 degrees at this end. And then as time went by, if you measured the temperature along the rod, you would find that the temperature was increasing along the rod as the heat moves along uh, as a result of this progression because of the um, molecules vibrating and causing their neighbors to vibrate. A practical example of this is maybe a saucepan on the cooker being heated and uh, there's its handle and on occasions you're boiling water let's say on occasion I leave the spoon in the saucepan a metal spoon and what do I find I pick up the metal spoon and I drop it again very quickly because the end of the spoon is very hot 
because the spoon has been heated, the spoon that's inside the water has been heated to boiling point, and the uh, heat has progressed along the spoon to the end and made that hot as well. That's the process of conduction. It's for that reason that the handle of the saucepan should not be made of um, something that conducts heat. All uh, objects, all solids will conduct heat, but as we shall see, some are better than others. Metals conduct heat a lot. Insulators conduct heat very little. So you really want your saucepan to be made of an insulator, some kind of plastic material. Don't buy a saucepan with a metal handle because that is likely to conduct the heat along and when you go to pick up the saucepan, it could be very hot. So why do metals conduct heat better than insulators? Well, just remember, we've done this before, what makes a metal a metal? A metal is a metal and a good conductor of electricity because it has free electrons. It not only has the molecules of the solid, but it also has free electrons. And because it's a conductor, that means those electrons can flow as an electric current. We did this when we did electricity. But of course, what it also means is that as you now heat this end of the rod, you're not just giving the molecules additional energy, which is what we did up here. So there's a little bit of additional vibration which slowly moves along the rod. You're also giving these free electrons, which are not held together by strong forces. You're also giving them additional energy and you're increasing their velocity and they can move across the bar much faster. And that's why heat transfers along a metal bar much quicker than it does along a insulator because the electrons that are free in the metal can much more quickly um, pass on their energy to other electrons by collisions with them so that the energy transfers much faster along the bar and so the heat transfers much faster along the bar. Now let's think about convection, which I said was mainly for liquids and gases. And it's about particles in those liquids and gases moving around. We'll start with a gas. In fact, we'll just start with air in your room. This is a room and this is a radiator in the room. Radiators are badly named because in fact, what most radiators do is to convect heat. They do not radiate it and they radiate up to a certain point, but their principal way of operation is convection. Because what happens is you've got maybe very hot water in this radiator, that makes that radiator very hot compared to the room. The air immediately above the radiator will therefore also get hot. And here is a property of most things that as they get hotter, they get less dense. That's certainly true of liquids and gases. So these, this air, this gas, as it gets hotter, it gets less dense. Less dense air will rise. So this air that's hot rises into the room. It can't leave a vacuum, so colder air comes in and takes its place. But that is then also heated by the radiator and it becomes hot. It too will rise and other air will come in and take its place. And of course, this air which has risen will of course now, since it's no longer in contact with the radiator, it will gradually cool. And so as it cools, if hot air rises, cold air falls. So it begins to fall and in due course, it will take its place again over the radiator as it's heated. And so you've got just this kind of cycle of air throughout the room. And those are convection currents. And it's basically the movement, the circulation of the particles of air or the molecules of air that are moving around the room. They are heated above the radiator. The hot air rises, colder air takes its place. Exactly the same thing happens with liquids in, say, an immersion heater, the kind of heater that you might have in your hot water tank. The heater is typically placed at the bottom of the water tank, and this is full of water. And what happens is that as the water when the electric immersion heater is switched on, 
the water immediately above it will get hot. Hot water rather like hot air rises, so all this water rises through the tank and is replaced, of course, by cold water, which is heated. And as that gets hot, that too rises in the tank. More cold water replaces it. That too is circulated. The water as it gets to the top of the, hang, uh, the tank cools and then falls back again and is recycled. But in a small tank and with a sufficiently powerful heater, what you will find is that the average temperature of the water will continue to increase until the whole of the tank is filled with hot water, at which point you can switch the immersion heater off. But the process by which that water went from cold to hot is a convection current as the molecules of the water were heated above the heater, rose through the tank, were replaced by cold water, which itself was heated above the heater, uh, rose through the tank, and you've got this circulation going on and each cycle produces the water at a slightly higher temperature until the whole of the water in the tank is hot. Now, obviously, one of the things you'd need to worry about is that having got the tank hot, if you just leave it like that and you switch the immersion, he immersion heater off, it will get cold um, because heat will escape. So one of the things you have to think about is lagging your tank. And usually the lagging is a, a material which prevents airflow. All of this is achieved through airflow. If you can stop the airflow, if you can have little pockets of air that can't move anywhere because they're trapped in little um, polystyrene or um, plastic uh, uh, little nodules, then they can't flow anywhere. And plastic, of course, is an insulator. So heat does not conduct very well through it. So this kind of padding that you put around the tank will stop the heat from escaping either by conduction or by convection through that padding. It's the same reason you put on a coat when you go out on a cold day. The idea is that you trap the air between your coat and uh, whatever clothes you've got on and underneath your coat so that the, the warm air that's close to your body can't get through your coat which is basically an insulating material anyway, but it's made up of fibres that are trapping the air. So there's no flow of air away from you, so you don't lose as much heat. Animal hair or animal fur does the same thing. That fur traps the air so that the uh, body heat of the animal cannot escape because there's no immediate flow of air away from their skin because there's a small pocket of air trapped in the hair or the fur of the animal that stops it from getting away. The third means by which heat can be transferred is radiation. And that is principally achieved through infrared, which was one of the electromagnetic waves that we discovered when we were looking at waves. And that is the mechanism, for example, by which the heat gets to us from the sun. The sun is obviously hot it cannot possibly conduct to Earth because there's nothing solid between the Sun and the Earth along which it can be conducted. It can't be convected because space, there's 93 million miles of space between us and the Sun. It's not completely empty, but it's more or less empty. It's, it's a pretty good vacuum. There's no air to convect the heat. The only way that heat can get to us is through infrared radiation. And radiation, the electromagnetic waves, can travel through a vacuum. That's the key thing. Of course, once the heat gets into the Earth's atmosphere, then you could expect that there would be some convection because you then start to warm up the air that is in the atmosphere. But that doesn't arise until you actually get into the atmosphere. Over 93 million miles of space, you're wholly reliant on the infrared heat from the sun. All objects emit and absorb infrared. So we, as a body, we are giving off heat and we also receive and absorb heat. If we give off more than we receive, 
then our temperature will go down because we're giving off more heat than we receive. So we are losing heat. If we receive more heat than we give off, then our temperature will go up because we're receiving more than we give away. Spontaneously, heat always moves from hot to cold. Heat moves from a hot body to a cold body. That's spontaneously. And in fact, there's a special name for that. That is, in essence, the second law of thermodynamics. You can make heat go from cold to hot, but you have to do a lot of work to make that happen. For example, that's what happens in a fridge or a freezer. You take a cold fridge or a cold freezer and you take even more heat out of it to make it even colder. And you put that heat into the warm room. So you're actually moving heat from cold to hot to make the cold even colder and the hot even hotter. But you have to use an, an engine, a machine to do that. It won't do it automatically. If you open the door of the fridge and just switch it off and leave it, what will happen is that the hot temperature of the room will make the cold fridge hotter. The temperature of the room, the heat in the room will move in and transfer to the cold part of the fridge. That's what happens spontaneously. So what we're saying is that if you've got a hot body compared to the rest of its surroundings, it will be a net emitter of infrared. And if you've got a cold body compared with the rest of its surroundings, it will be a net receiver of infrared. So heat moves out of a hot body, heat moves into a cold body. The hotter a body is, the more infrared it will emit. In other words, the hotter something is, the greater the rate of cooling. And although you cannot see infrared, it's outside your visible range, you can feel it. If you're standing outside in the sun, you feel the heat of the sun. If you're standing by an electric fire, you feel the warmth of the fire. Here's a little question for you. It's break time at school and your teacher wants a cup of coffee. And he wants that coffee to be as hot as possible. So you make the coffee with the boiling water. And the question is, he can't drink it for another five minutes. Do you put the milk in now? Or do you wait until he's about to drink it and then put the milk in? So the question is, milk now or milk in five minutes? Remember, he wants that coffee to be as hot as possible. Which should you do? Well, whenever you put the milk in, you're going to reduce the temperature of the coffee by a certain amount. So since you're going to have to put the milk in at some stage, the effect of the milk is neither here nor there. That's going to cancel out in both. The real question is, what will the milk do when you add it to the coffee? If you add it to the coffee now, then the temperature of that coffee will fall because you've added cold milk to it. And if the temperature falls, less heat will be radiated away in infrared. On the other hand, if you don't add the milk to the coffee, it will be much hotter and hotter bodies emit more infrared. So in the five minutes that we've got to wait, a lot more heat will leave the coffee. So the real answer is, if you want the coffee to be as hot as possible, you put the milk in at the beginning, not when he's just about to drink it. Because if you put it in at the beginning, you reduce the overall temperature of the coffee, that will reduce the overall amount of heat loss. Whether or not an object will absorb or emit infrared also depends on its colour. If you have dark objects, they tend to absorb more infrared if you have light objects, they tend to reflect infrared. So if you have, let's say, a black object and a white object, and you put them in the sun, what you will typically find is that the black object will absorb 
the infrared and therefore get hotter and therefore its temperature will increase, the white object will reflect the infrared, therefore will not absorb the infrared, therefore its temperature will not increase, at least not so much. And what you find is that the black object gets much hotter than the white object does. And that brings us to an object called a thermos flask. One of these flasks you can buy that keeps hot things hot or it keeps cold things cold. How does it work? Well, essentially it's got to stop heat from getting away by any of the three methods, by conduction, convection or radiation. So what you typically find is that a thermos flask has a, is basically made of glass. This is the inner part of the thermos flask, is made of glass. Glass is an insulator and therefore heat will not conduct across that glass. There is also, the glass is made in a little tube like this, so that inside the glass is a vacuum. They suck all the air out. Now, nothing, you cannot conduct across a vacuum and you cannot convect across a vacuum. So now you've got two layers of glass, which will stop conduction, a, a space which is filled with a vacuum, which will not allow conduction or convection. So we've cut out two means by which here is the fluid, let's say it's hot water in the flask. Two means by which that heat might get out. Conduction and convection are both pretty much stopped. But we haven't yet dealt with radiation. Problem with radiation is that can travel across a vacuum. As I told you, sun's rays travel 93 million miles across space, which is pretty much a vacuum. So how are we gonna stop the infrared heat from escaping by radiation? We essentially put a silver screen around the glass and that will reflect the heat back in again now incidentally it will also reflect any heat trying to get in from the outside out again so infrared either way is either kept in or it's kept out so if you have cold things in here it means that the heat can't get in and if you have hot things in here, it means the heat can't get out. And then what you usually do is to put that all into a plastic container and you rest it on polystyrene pads. Polystyrene, of course, is also, polystyrene is also an insulator, so the heat cannot easily get across from here either. You put a cap on it and that's your thermos flask. The heat, and the, is, the heat is kept in or alternatively kept out by a combination of glass, which stops conduction, a vacuum, which stops conduction and convection, and a silver screen around the outside, which stops or at least reflects the infrared.